Your presentation was extremely interesting, on point. The uh, first thing I had in the beginning of your presentation, uh, you mentioned that the plastic circularity is actually coming down. I'm sure all of us here are under the impression that uh, that is something that should be going up with all the focus. This is race seven, right, Sajid? So with all the focus that we have on circularity that is happening, uh, can you explain to us why is this taking place? Yeah, I think it's, it's uh, as I mentioned, it's not universal. Some places are um, performing quite well and circularity and recycling rates um, are improving. But that's not the general story. Generally, recycling rates um, are going down. And circularity, as, as a general uh, principle, is going down. I think there's, there's many reasons. Um, we have a, a global economy that's growing um, and lifting millions of people out of poverty every year, which is, which is fantastic. But if you look at where the highest growth rates are, they tend to be in parts of the world where perhaps um, it's harder for people to be able to afford products that are designed around circular principles. Circularity does cost money. Uh, linear products are cheaper. They're only cheaper because you're not factoring in the cost of externalities. If you factor in all of the costs, then circular products um, are, are, not cheap, uh, are not more expensive. But, uh, of course, we don't do that at the moment. So there is a sort of, um, I think, an aspect of this which is just around economic growth and uh, expanding middle class with their demand for products. Um, and we haven't been able to build the recycling systems and the waste management systems to keep up uh, with that economic growth. Um, but I think there are many, many other reasons as well. Um, uh, we, and again, some of the speakers earlier have talked around the need for, for policy mechanisms, for policy thing, new policies, um, for new financing mechanisms, and so on. But I think there's inter an interesting angle around companies and how companies think around circularity. Because I think a lot of them today, they recognize the importance of it, but they're thinking of circularity more as um, an end game, um, something that um, is, is to be um, sort of worked on because it's important. But they're not thinking about circularity as a pathway to the future success of their business. They're not, they're not putting circularity thinking at the sort of the center of the company. It's just something they need to achieve. Um, and I think that companies need to think much more about centrality as a fundamental principle of the future of their company. And that does require quite a big um, mindset change. So I think that's, uh, th th there's many reasons, but that's you know, sort of a few. I absolutely agree. I think it's the mindset. Mm. Because uh, when you look at uh, companies, like you correctly said, uh, it's more the regulation part that they are adhering to rather than, you know, something that they need to look forward in the future. Mm -hmm. And I remember uh, in my travels, maybe even 20 years ago in Europe, uh, recycled products were available at that point of time in the market. And uh, they were more expensive than virgin products. And people already had the mindset change at that point of time to actually pay a few cents more for a recycled product. So I think the focus also has to be in changing the mindset. Mm -hmm of all the individuals as well as the companies. Yeah, fully agree. And, and mindset change, and many, there's a lot to do around consumers um, and their awareness and their understanding and behavioral change there. But I think at the company level, that's, that's critical too. Absolutely. Um, what are the barriers that uh, prevent the value chains uh, from collaborating to solve uh, common challenges? I think it's, you know, if you think of a value chain, of course, it's not just a collection of companies, it's a collection of industries. And every industry looks at a challenge like this through its own particular lens. They have different priorities and, and different capabilities and resources and goals. And so I think uh, one of the fundamental challenges is trying to bring together those varied and diverse understandings of the challenge and try to build a common understanding and alignment in how we think about the challenge and, what's, and, and the causes of it um, and the potential solutions. And you know, building that common understanding is hard and it takes time and it takes effort. Um, and so none of this is easy. Um, it's, it does take that time and effort. Um, and I think, but I think that's the first step, is building that common understanding. And even once you've got that common understanding, the solutions that then present themselves as, as to, to solve this uh, won't necessarily be, uh, not everyone will agree on them. Um, I can give you a, a good example is sort of just sort of recycling technologies. Uh, and everyone here, I'm sure, is, is very familiar with, you know, you know, we have mechanical recycling, the sort of more traditional type, and then you have chemical recycling, which is more emerging and, and nascent. 
Um, and depending on where you are in the value chain, you will potentially favor mechanical recycling, particularly if you're a waste manager, um, or chemical recycling, if you're more on the resin producer side. And so there's, 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 there's no um, common belief in exactly what the solutions look like, but at least if we've built that common understanding of the challenge and a common understanding of the range of solutions, that's a, a good place to start from. Yeah, I think if it is established that, you know, this particular sector needs to go into mechanical, this particular sector needs to go to chemical, it will emerge to be something even better. But, you know, like you said, uh, getting into this understanding, it's easier said than done. Um, because sustainability demands collaborations, right? Mm. Between companies and industry sectors, that's what you said. Mm. But it can also be the source of competition. Mm. So how do you manage that uh, tension between collaboration and uh, competition? I think it's a fascinating question because um, I think there are still many, many companies that look at sustainability and think of it as a source of competitive differentiation particularly in the branded goods sector. Um, you know, we know that consumers are concerned about the environment. We know they care about sustainability and circularity. And so for brands, it's a nice way to differentiate themselves and tell a nice story about who they are and what they do and how they act and so on. So um, uh, trying to um, you know, bring people together to collaborate um, isn't always um, a sort of a natural um, action for companies. I should say that competition is a fantastic uh, mechanism for driving innovation and change. So we would always uh, respect the need for competition as a critical piece of driving a circular economy. You do want companies competing with each other to be better, to be more circular, to be more sustainable. But you also have to recognize that this is a systems level challenge. And no one company, no one industry um, can do it on their own. So there is alongside that competitive dynamic, the need for collaboration. And it's about working out what are the things that demand collaboration and what are the things that are best addressed through competition. And I think on the collaboration side, the enabling ecosystem is, is particularly important. What's the policy context? What are the financing mechanisms? Extended producer responsibility, uh, for example. Um, standards, product standards. <clears throat> How can you align on product standards so that they become simpler um, and therefore easier for products to be recycled. We know there are hundreds of thousands of different resin types. Is there a possibility to simplify those to make recycling systems uh, and waste streams simpler and easier to process? So there are areas where collaboration is essential, but we don't want to forget that the competitive dynamic is also critical to drive um, improvement as well. Well said. Um, <coughs> you talked about two of the projects that you are presently doing. And in your slide, I was uh, glad to see uh, there were several green dots in India as well. So what are the projects that you have underway in India right now? Um, so we have, um, we actually have, uh, of our 58 projects globally, 10 of them are here in India. Um, and so India is a, is, a, is a critical priority geography for us. Um, I have a colleague here, Esha Saar, um, who uh, is our country head for India. So if you have a chance to meet her, she can give you the, the, the in-depth detail. I would recommend that. But essentially, um, we have 10 projects here, and our portfolio is growing. We're focused on a few um, different things. We're definitely focused on improving waste management, and in particular, integrated waste management, sort of set up on a public-private cooperation, working with the ULBs here to design new and improved and better waste management systems. So that's certainly um, a big part of our, of our strategy. We're also very interested in developing projects around supporting SMEs, small and medium-sized enterprises, particularly in the collection and the recycling um, space, because we recognize that they often don't have the working capital to be able to invest in machinery that can drive up their productivity and their efficiency. You know, a collector, if you give them a bailing machine, suddenly they can aggregate the waste and it becomes much more economic to transport it um, because it's much, much denser. Uh, same for recyclers, you know, if we can give them washing lines. This is not expensive machinery, so we're looking at leasing models that can potentially help to equip SMEs with some of this basic equipment that can really drive up um, the efficiency there. We're also very focused on the informal sector. We know that there are about one and a half million informal workers, uh, rag pickers, uh, in India. They're critical to the, to the waste management sector. Um, and we want, if we can, to help adjust transition 
to improve their lives, their incomes, the health and safety uh, conditions under which they operate, uh, potentially bring them into the formal sector um, if that's the most appropriate way. So thinking about a just transition for the, uh, for the informal sector um, is critical. We're doing a lot of work around community engagement and raising awareness, driving behavioral change at the consumer level. Can we start to do household segregation? Um, and what's the sort of the, the principles and processes for, for driving that awareness? And then lastly, we're also looking at um, digital opportunities. Because if we can trace the waste, um, it, it will significantly improve our ability to manage these waste streams. So um, simple things like putting QR codes onto waste collection bins um, so that informal workers can, can track where waste is being picked up, and then you can start flowing it through the, the, the whole value chain. So there's a lot of opportunity around digital um, empowerment of, of the waste system. So lots of different things, um, but it's, it's a priority for us and, and lots of opportunity. Sounds great. In fact, um, I really like your idea in terms of uh, leasing out uh, the equipment which actually puts uh, lesser burden on the processor to do the recycling. We have some government agencies here. In fact, I'd like to suggest the government agencies, why don't you see machinery technology is one part, the other part is land. Land is so expensive here in India the government definitely has to look at sourcing land and leasing this out. I think this will also empower the processor to move forward in the right direction, and I think our circularity numbers can really improve if we can establish something like this. Okay, we have about three minutes left. I think we can take one or maybe two questions from the audience. Are there any questions? Just, just on, the, on the question of land, that's one of the, the, the sort of the characteristics that we look for when we set up a public-private cooperation with the ULB is that they often provide the land for us because oh, that, um, you know, it is, as you say, a very expensive consideration. Yes, it is. Hi, Justin. This is uh, Dr. Gupta from the Polymer Update Academy. My question was regarding uh, the... Uh, there are Majorly, there are two forms which are very popular. That is the mechanical recycling and the thermochemical recycling. Now, I have heard both the school of thoughts where people say that if you really want to eliminate plastic waste, you have to work through the channels where chemical recycling is the option because the waste which is not taken care through the mechanical recycling route has to pass through the chemical recycling to eliminate it. More so in uh, developing countries where segregation at source is not very popular in particular. And then we have also heard about the mechanical recycling sort of ruling the recycling market because of the quality and the value of uh, material that you get from that route. So what are your thoughts on it? So if you want to go further and then uh, the, the, uh, if you want to really eliminate waste and uh, put it through the loop, what do you think is uh, going to, you know, uh, take the shape going forward? Will it be mechanical or will it, will it be the chemical uh, route of recycling? No, I think it's, it's a great question and it's a question that we grapple with uh, frequently. Um, it's also, I think, another good example of where that uh, value chain collaboration is critical in answering this. Our sort of our view right now is that um, the, the ultimately we're going to need both. We're going to need mechanical and we're going to need uh, chemical. Um, uh, one, you, you can't rely on one to do everything. You, you, need, you need a mix of the two. The, the, the critical thing is deciding which types of plastic and which types of setting um, are most um, sort of appropriate for mechanical and which are most appropriate for chemical. And I think there aren't easy answers there. Um, there's a lot of thinking that needs to be done. And we have um, a, an actually an expert group made up of people from our member companies that is considering exactly that question. You know, where is, where, what's the role for mechanical versus chemical? What situations, what resin types and so on? So great question and we don't have the answer yet, but we are working on it. I'd like to touch on that uh, question a bit because that's my area of operation. So in terms of chemical recycling, what happens is when it's uh, multiple different plastics which can't be really segregated. Mm. In such a situation, chemical recycling is the best technology that is available. In terms of mechanical recycling, when you can segregate the plastic. So today, uh, Madam, uh, uh, not Madam, sorry, the gentleman who came in first, he's no longer here with us, the Neeti gentleman. He mentioned that, you know, it's sad to see the bottle, but you'd be surprised. In India, over 90% of the PET bottles are being recycled. It's amongst the highest percentage in the world. So, and it's purely done through mechanical recycling, right? So if you talk of HDP, you talk of PE, uh, polyethylene, polypropylene, all these are mechanically recycled. But you talk of multi-layer films and things like that, that's where chemical recycling plays a very important role. Uh, madam, this is the last question. Okay. Sir. Thank you, Thank you for that. 
I, th I don't think I need an introduction. You must be in the uh, inaugural session. I'm Sanchita Jinder. My question is specifically about the informal sector. Like collection uh, is the biggest challenge in meeting the EPR. Collection in, in India, you know that we are ahead of other European countries and all other. We have 60% recycling rate here. That is through the informal sector only. But that is, again, a formal chain. Uh, like the smaller one gives to bigger one, bigger one gives to bigger one, and ultimately it reaches to the, uh, kabadi, uh, to the recyclers. My, my problem is India has the biggest problem of littered, littered waste. Because all over, whenever we see, despite this Swach, uh, Swachhita Abhiyan and everything, we find every city is littered with so much waste. Right. So my special question is to you is, are you doing anything for collecting that waste from the roadside or from, because that is the biggest problem in our country. Otherwise, formal cycle to recycle, everything is getting recycled. Our biggest problem is the roadside waste. So are you doing anything to educate people to collect that waste and getting it into the formal cycle or for recycling or waste to energy or whatever end of the life, uh, maybe cement kilns or road or something. But are you doing anything for that? Yeah. Well, I think it, it, the, the collection challenge is, is very big and, it, and it, there are no silver bullet answers. It, it, it requires a lot of, lot of thinking and, and it's very context specific. Waste is a local issue and you have to understand there are broad principles, but they need to be applied um, at a local level. But we, we do have um, quite a number of waste collection uh, projects where we're designing new systems for collecting the waste. And whenever we have a project like that, there's always a very strong community engagement aspect to it. Because um, you, you can't tell people that they need to um, uh, have, uh, manage their waste in a different way if you haven't built the system to, to, uh, to enable them to do it. And if you build a system, you then have to teach people how to use it. So going out into those communities, helping them to understand why this is important, helping them to understand uh, the new system and how to behave and connect to it um, is critical. So we are doing quite a lot of that. Um, and, um, uh, but but it, it, the way we do it and, and, and the way we do these collections does vary from, from, from place to place. But the, uh, One minute, sir. So let me say not only system. I'd say this is actually an educational issue. It's a mindset issue. It's a social stigma. Because unfortunately, you and I litter here in our country when we travel to, say, Singapore. We don't litter. Our mindset changes. Why is that? So it's a social stigma. I think we definitely need to educate. And this education needs to start from the junior level. And you know, it needs to be built up. That mindset has to change. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Justin. Yeah. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.